Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar.com. This podcast is brought to you by Oppenheimer Funds. There are big investment opportunities beyond our borders. Megatrends is a podcast from Oppenheimer Funds that explores the trends reshaping the global economy. Subscribe to Megatrends wherever you listen. This week on the podcast, Christine Benz offers tips on portfolio makeovers, reducing risk in your portfolio amid volatility, the outlook for healthcare stocks with the new Congress, why the market is skeptical of the China trade truce, Exxon's dividends look safe, and fun winners and losers during market rockiness. Let's get started. Christine Benz discusses ways to make over your own portfolio. This week on Morningstar, we're featuring five real-life portfolio makeovers by Christine Benz, our Director of Personal Finance. She's joining me today to talk about how to do your own portfolio makeover. Christine, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, it's great to be here. Uh, the first thing that you need to do to actually have your own portfolio makeover is to gather all the information, right? That's right. And this is something I put all of our portfolio makeover candidates through. I ask them to provide me with a lot of data. So account statements, the most recent account statements you can find, Social Security statements so you can project your benefits. If you're someone who is covered by a pension, you want to gather those pension documents um, and get your arms around what sort of pension benefits benefits you might be able to rely on in retirement. So definitely data gathering would be the first step. And once you have that basic piece down, you should start evaluating your progress towards your goal. Right. That's the key thing I think about when I'm looking at these portfolios is just, is this plan on track? So for accumulators, you want to gauge the adequacy of what you've managed to save so far. And here I really like the fidelity benchmarks where they have different uh, savings targets by age band, and I think those can be a good starting point for people. I also think for accumulators, this is a great place to turn to a to some sort of an online retirement calculator to gauge the viability of, of your progress so far. So one I've often recommended is T. Rowe Price's Retirement Income Calculator, but a lot of uh, financial providers have their own calculators and tools. Run through a few of them just to get a sense of whether your current balance plus your ongoing savings rate puts you on track to reach your retirement goal. If you're someone who's already retired, you want to think about your withdrawal rate um, and think about perhaps the 4% guideline as a starting point for gauging your portfolio's withdrawal rate. I've written a lot about this topic over the past few years. People want to think about their own portfolio portfolio's asset allocation, as well as where they are in their retirement trajectory. So people who are young retirees, say under 65, would want to be much more conservative than 4%, whereas older retirees may be able to be a little bit more aggressive in their withdrawals. But that's definitely the key thing to think about for people who are already retired and drawing from their portfolios. The next step is to look at your overall asset allocation. That's right. And here I like Morningstar's x-ray tool. If you've gathered up all of your account statements, you can enter all of your holdings in Morningstar's portfolio manager or use our instant x-ray tool to enter those holdings. And that way you can get a, a read on your total portfolio's asset allocation. Then you want to just gauge whether that's reasonable. And if you are someone who is uh, accumulating assets for retirement or already retired, you might use Morningstar's lifetime allocation indexes, which are put together by our colleagues in Morningstar Investment Management. Or you might use a good target date fund or two, just to see, well, is my asset allocation, is, is it in the same ballpark as what these professionals are recommending? If it's not, and you might have a very good reason for it not to be, why not? And make sure that you're thinking, thinking that through. That gives you a sense of that broad asset allocation yes. of stocks versus bonds, say, but there could still be allocations uh, on sectors or style box weightings that you'd want to take a closer look at as well. That's right. And this is something I certainly look at when conducting the portfolio makeovers. So here again, I think our x-ray functionality, functionality can be super helpful. You're looking at sector positioning relative to the S&P 500. You're also looking at your portfolio style box exposure. So are you listing heavily toward one side of the style box? or the other? Are you listing heavily toward small stocks versus large? Not to say that you can't have some of those bets in your portfolio if you have a good reason for positioning your portfolio that way, but just saying that you want to be aware of them and make sure that you're not making any big, scary, inadvertent bets. 
This is also a time to check out to make sure you don't have too much uh, overweight in any given security. That's right. So here, again, X-Ray has this stock in intersection tool that shows you how much you have in various securities in your portfolio. Um, so you want to take a look at that, make sure that you haven't inadvertently made a big bet on some stock by buying it outright when maybe a mutual fund in your portfolio also holds it. So watch out for very large individual stock bets. Certainly, if you have employer stock as part of your plan, that can be a big risk factor for a lot of people because their financial wherewithal is also riding on the, on the company. So watch out for that as well. If you're looking to streamline your accounts a little bit, streamline your portfolio, what would be some ways to do that here? This is definitely something that should be part of any portfolio makeover process. So start at the account level, see if there aren't like account types that you can collapse together. Maybe you have old, old rollover IRAs, multiple versions of them that you can put together into one large IRA, for example. That'll reduce your, on, your oversight on an ongoing basis. So start with accounts, then move on to holdings. You may have holdings that are redundant with one another. Or maybe you have one large cap growth fund that largely duplicates exposure that you're getting through your total market index fund. So look for opportunities to streamline, ideally at the same time to lower costs and improve your overall holdings quality at the same time. How about taxes? This is another great opportunity to look at improving your portfolio's tax efficiency. So if you are making contributions, are you making them to your tax sheltered vehicles? If you have taxable accounts, are those accounts as tax efficient as possible? For a lot of people, this is as simple as holding equity exchange traded funds as well as municipal bonds and bond funds for their taxable accounts. And finally, for people who are already in drawdown mode, Mode, it makes sense to think about tax-efficient withdrawal sequencing. And that's a topic that I've written a lot about on Morningstar.com, where you're basically hanging on to those accounts with the be best tax benefits, like Roth accounts, to last in your withdrawal queue and potentially tapping less tax-efficient accounts before them. What other risk factors should you be considering when doing a makeover? You really want to look inward and think about your own personal risks. Some recent examples from makeovers have included uh, people who haven't insured against long-term care. That's certainly a big risk factor for people later in life that they might incur these lo large unfunded costs. So you want to think about, well, if I haven't insured against long-term care costs, do I have enough assets in my portfolio to cover those costs later in life? Another recent example was um, an individual who had a pension that she would be bringing into retirement, but the pension covered her life only, and there would no, be no benefit for her husband if she predeceased him. So you want to think about problem spots like that that could arrive. In this case, the recommendation was that they purchase life insurance should she predecease her husband. So think about all of your individual specific risk factors, I think that that should definitely be part of any sort of portfolio makeover process. Christine, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. Thanks for watching. Overwhelmed by the market? Morningstar Premium will help you cut through the noise and find the most promising investments. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. Next, ways to reduce risk in your portfolio as the market stumbles. For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. With volatility in the stock market dominating headlines again, many investors might be wondering if they can or if they should reduce risk in their portfolio. I'm here with Christine Ben. She's our Director of Personal Finance. We're going to take a closer look at four light ways to reduce risk. Christine, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, it's great to be here. Uh, maybe we should start with what uh, generally isn't advisable, and that's just a wholesale de-risking of entire portfolio, particularly for investors that are far away from retirement. Yeah, that is not a strategy I would advise. It does perhaps provide some short-term peace of mind if you're seeing the market drop a lot over a period of days or weeks. It can provide some short-term comfort to just get Get out of everything altogether, move everything to the safe investment on offer in your investment program. But the key reason why you don't want to do that is that 
inevitably you'll be stuck wondering when do I get back in because the market often is is streaky and will often log its best days on a series of um, short bursts as opposed to you know sort of a, a slow steady progression so that um, sort of relief can quickly be replaced with worry about well am I doing the right thing here and when's the back, best time to edge back into stocks but your first tip for uh, a light way to de-risk is to potentially cut back on stocks through rebalancing that this is a great time to look at your asset allocation. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I sometimes wince when I hear people on TV or uh, in other places saying, nobody do anything, the market's down. Well, guess what? You know, a lot of people haven't been doing anything for their with their portfolios for 10 years. That means that they could, in fact, be heavier on equities relative to their life stage than they actually should be if they've just been letting their winners ride. So even if you haven't done anything and you, your portfolio balance has been sinking lower and your equity holdings have been sinking lower, it still may be the right call to de-risk that portfolio a little bit, to take some money off the table in stocks and move it into bonds or perhaps cash. That will tend to be less advisable. The younger you are, the more you should use the market dips as an opportunity to add more to stocks, not less. But for people who are getting close to retirement, people who are 50 and above, absolutely they should use our x-ray functionality, see where they are now, compare it to a target, and see if some de-risking is in order. Within asset classes, too, your second tip is to maybe think about being in more defensive sectors or in more defensive bond funds. Absolutely, because, um, again, if investors have been just kind of letting their winners ride, they'll tend to have a uh, concentration in the growth side of the style box, even though that's been the epicenter of the recent market weakness. Um, in fact, some of the portfolios that I've been working on in our portfolio makeover series have been very heavy on growth stocks. So um, check that out. Think about, especially, again, if you are someone who's getting close to drawdown, getting close to retirement, think about giving your portfolio equity weighting a little bit more of a defensive cast. So you might emphasize quality more. more. If you're a individual stock picker, you might focus on what we call wide moat companies. You might emphasize dividends a little more. And you might also uh, invest in some sort of a product that uh, focuses on the subset of stocks that we classify as low volatility or that index providers classify as low volatility. So those are ways to stay in equities, but give your portfolio a little bit more of a conservative bias. And you can do the same on the bond side, where um, you might have in your portfolio some lower quality bond holdings, maybe some more income focused bond holdings. Well, if you are concerned about volatility related to the equity market, make sure that your bond holdings are really ballast for you, that they're going to deliver for you on days when the equity market sells off. And so that's generally high quality bonds. Um, long duration bonds often perform best on big equity market down days. But I think for investors who are looking for a low risk bond portfolio, they'd probably want to focus on short and intermediate duration bonds. You say this is a time to potentially reduce idiosyncratic risk. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that's a, a great thing to do at times like these. So scout around your portfolio just to see if you're taking any big, dumb risks in your portfolio. Things like major style concentrations, major sector concentrations, major concentrations in individual holdings. And company stock is one that I would call out as something to avoid a big concentrated bet in because so much of your individual wherewithal is riding on your company's fortunes. So that's a place to look if, if you're re attempting to reduce security-specific risk in your portfolio. Finally, you think this could be a good time to review your portfolio maintenance uh, regiment. Well, why is that? Well, I would say for people who have specific holdings that are causing them a lot of angst, there may be some tweaks that you could make without completely upending your plan to reduce your exposure to those very volatile positions. So for people who are making additional ongoing contributions, say through a 401k plan, well, maybe you just reduce your future contributions to those holdings, not your contributions overall, but to those problematic holdings. That would be one way to maybe buy yourself 
helpful little peace of mind. Another idea is if you're kind of in maintenance mode with your portfolio where you're neither adding to it or withdrawing from it necessarily, um, reinvesting the dividends and capital gains distributions. A lot of us have those box boxes checked with our fund providers. Maybe uncheck them for the holdings that are, again, causing you the most angst and causing the most volatility in your portfolio. You're not barreling out of them altogether, but you're just saying, well, for now at least I'm not going to commit additional capital. And finally, for retirees, I do think that they have an opportunity if they have holdings that they've found especially problematic to tie their um, scaling back on those positions in with whatever withdrawal system they're using. So if they're pulling from their portfolio anyway, why not pull from those holdings that are causing them a lot of angst? Those are some easy ways to reduce exposure to positions without getting out of those positions altogether. Christine, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. Thanks for watching. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date, independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Now, Damian Conover on the healthcare outlook with a new Congress. The U.S. elections recently completed, and the outcome has left us with a split Congress, which has implications for the healthcare sector that I think investors need to be aware of. When we take a step back, we think the split Congress will likely mean less radical change to U.S. healthcare policies. And what that means is we'll likely see smaller implementation of past laws that have already been uh, voted on but not yet enacted. And we wanted to walk through some of those and then also what is likely to happen from the rhetoric standpoint. So we think the most important upcoming change is an increase into the donut hole discount. What that means is when patients get to a certain point in spending, their drug prices are going to change by the amount of the discount offered by the drug company. So the discount historically had been at about 50%, that's going up to 70%. So that's that's going to hurt the drug firms, but let's keep the magnitude in mind here. This is probably about a 1% earnings hit to the large cap pharmaceutical and large cap biotechnology firms. So this is something we think is manageable through some price increases elsewhere within the uh, drug distribution space as well as through some cost cutting. The second thing that's very likely to happen is increased pricing negotiation for Part B drugs. You know, these are drugs that are administered in the hospital. Now, this is something we think a split Congress can get behind and likely pass, so that will likely in, uh, cause some more pricing headwinds for the drug and biotechnology firms, probably in the neighborhood of about a 2% hit. So in this backdrop of you know, increasing pricing pressure, we still think the drug space is an interesting place to invest in because we think those costs on the drug firms are manageable. And we think that the firms will be able to, again, cut costs or increase prices elsewhere to get around those increasing pricing concerns. One thing that we think is also important is the increased rhetoric that is very likely to come out of Congress and the President's office. And that is lowering U.S. drug prices that are something compatible to what we see in other developed markets. We think this is unlikely to actually come through. We think it's going to be more rhetoric. And the reason why is there's a high degree of complexity around bringing U.S. drug prices down to develop uh, market prices outside the U.S. because of access issues outside the U.S. versus the U.S. That leads us to believe that it's very likely going to continue to be spoken about but not enacted. So within this landscape of a new Congress and what we're anticipating not being major change in the political landscape, we're highlighting a couple ideas for investors. First off is underappreciated innovation. Roche is a name we really like, very strong position in immuno oncology as well as several other therapeutic areas we think the market is underappreciating. Also, any sort of company that can do well in creating more value for anything within the healthcare landscape. Medtronic is a name that we think is underappreciated in this respect. They're bringing out a lot of products that have the ability to save costs for hospitals. And then also certain companies just have certain special situations that we think are well positioned for investors. Bayer, we think there's a huge overreaction in some litigation that its crop science business is facing. We think that's an opportunity for investors. 
And then lastly, on the M&A front, we think that will continue to happen. And we think it's important for investors to be aware of potential opportunities of targets that could be acquired. Biomarin, we think, is at the top of this list. And the reason why is this firm's focused on rare disease drugs. And this is an area where a lot of the large cap pharmaceutical and biotechnology firms want to gain more traction. We think an easy entry point is by acquiring Biomarin. This podcast is brought to you by Oppenheimer Funds. There are big investment opportunities beyond our borders. Megatrends is a podcast from Oppenheimer Funds that explores the trends reshaping the global economy. Subscribe to Megatrends wherever you listen. Next, Stephen Ellis analyzes the China trade truce difficulties. The market had been rightly, I think, skeptical around the Trump and the U.S.-China trade truce agreement announced over the weekend. And, you know, we think the market is skeptical for three major reasons. You know, first, if you look at the readouts from the China and the U.S. delegations, you know, there's not necessarily a lot of uh, agreement between the two. You know, for example, uh, you know, the U.S. called for China to uh, push for a large increase in agricultural product purchases immediately, whereas the China really says nothing about that. Similarly, the China really says that you know, the U.S. will respect China's uh, one policy, one China policy, whereas the U.S. release didn't say anything about that. So net-net, you know, it just creates a lot of confusion about what is needed for this type of agreement to be successful. You know, second, uh, Robert Lighthizer has been appointed the uh, new lead negotiator for the U.S.-China uh, trade negotiations. And he is generally someone who's had a harder line on China in the past. And uh, so therefore, China's going to take a while to get used to dealing with a negotiator who can, again, take time. And third, and most importantly, you know, the core issues that are at stake here in terms of IP theft, technology transfer, industrial policy, made in China 2025, and cyber wars, you know, these are issues that have been going on for years and are extremely complicated. You know, resolving them in 90 days would be very unrealistic. Go from one investment analyst to 150. Sign up today for Morningstar Premium and let our independent and unbiased research staff help you find the best investments. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. Now, Alan Good looks at Exxon's dividend. ExxonMobil is currently trading at $77 per share, a nearly 15% discount to our $90 fair value estimate. At this level, its $0.82 quarterly dividend implies a yield of 4.3%. While lower than European peers, Shell, Total, and BP, it's higher than U.S. peer Chevron at 3.9%. Historically, Exxon has yielded less than Chevron. While the recent declines in oil prices have weighed on shares, we see the dividend is safe. Our estimate of its oil price break-even level, which is the level at which it can cover capital spending and dividends, is less than $50 per barrel. That is lower than current levels, as well as our estimate of mid-cycle prices of $60 per barrel. Over the last 10 years, Exxon has grown the dividend about 8% per year, but growth in recent years has slowed with the decline in oil prices. While Exxon is unlikely to match peers' cash returns versus via share buybacks, we estimate it will continue to prioritize dividend growth. As such, we expect dividend growth to reaccelerate in the next few years with growth of mid-single digits, closer to historical levels. Can your portfolio weather the market? Use our premium portfolio tools to identify risks and streamline your holdings. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. And finally, Russ Kinnell on Fund Winners and Losers. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. The S&P 500 has lost 7% over the past three months, and many growth-leaning mutual funds have lost more than that. Joining me to discuss some of the biggest leaders and laggards amid this stretch of volatile performance is Russ Kinnell. He's Director of Manager Research for Morningstar. Russ, thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. Russ, um, let's start with kind of the headlines. When you look at the categories, the diversified domestic equity fund categories, which have uh, suffered the most in this period of market volatility? Well, from the three-month perspective, small growth has been hit the hardest. It's down about 14%. Large growth is down about 10%. And as you know, over the last few years, growth has been the best performing right. area. So I take a, at least some of that must be just simply your, a little correction that, that they had had 
such a nice run up, very high expectations. So in, a, in that way, it makes sense that they might correct the most. Okay. So has the opposite side of the style box performed relatively better during this period? That's right. Uh, large value has lost the lease. It's down about 6%, which is a big improvement uh, on, on the growth side. So again, I think some of that is simply that value has been the underperforming area and therefore maybe better set, set up to lose less in this kind of environment. Okay. And of course, technology stocks have been kind of ground zero for this recent market volatility. So I guess it stands to reason that value funds would have less of some of those companies. That's right. The fangs and some other tech areas have really been hit hard. And, and so naturally, value funds tend to have very little exposure to the, the more aggressive side of tech. They might have some tech, but not the, the really fast moving ones. Okay. Um, let's talk about foreign stocks. Sometimes uh, when U.S. markets sell off, we see that foreign stocks fall further still. What's been the pattern this time around? Oh uh, Yeah. In, in this case, the, the foreign equity sell-off has really mirrored what we saw in the U.S., so pretty comparable performance. Only we entered the, the, the first half of the year was not nearly as good for foreign equity funds. So year to date, they're down significantly more than the U.S. So uh, this latest sell-off hasn't been worse, but for the year, it has been worse. Okay. Um, when we look at sector fund performance, um, we talked about how the technology sector has been the hardest hit area. Any other areas of note in terms of performing particularly well or poorly during this time frame? Yeah, energy has been another area that, that's been hit hard. Uh, on the positive side, it's really the, the defensive areas that generally you expect to do well, but it, it doesn't always work that way. But this time it has in that we're seeing utilities have, have held up the best. Uh, some other defensive, high quality consumer names have held up really nicely. So it's actually kind of fitting the, the basic idea, which is defensive uh, high quality names that are slower growth hold up well and the higher risk names have sold off. Okay. Um, we often tell investors to hold bond funds to be a stable portion of their portfolio when we have these equity market shocks. Have, have they been a good place to be of bond funds um, d generally delivered for investors during this time frame? Uh, only sort of. Uh, okay. They've been less bad. So most okay. bond funds have lost about 1% uh, over the trailing three months. So in a way, diversification does work, but not maybe as well as you'd hope. So uh, bond funds seem to be under pressure. We have a growing deficit, talk of inflation, uh, and that's put pressure on the bond market. Okay. Have there been safer spots to be within the bond fund space? It's shorter term and high, higher quality, I would assume, may have held up a little bit better? Uh, yeah, shorter term and higher quality has held up a little better. In general, we're seeing longer bonds sell off uh, the, the most. So uh, they've, they've done a little bit better, yes. Okay. You looked through the performance rankings at some funds that have performed especially poorly during this stretch of weak market performance. Oakmark Select was one that uh, you noted had particularly poor performance recently. What's going on there? Yeah, the fund's down about 15% over the trailing three months. And the reason is energy. Uh, Bill Nygren's been dialing up his exposure there. And unfortunately, so far, the timing has been bad. Uh, and that's really stung the fund. Okay. Uh, Fidelity Growth Company, probably not surprising to see that it, it has struggled recently. It tends to be really heavy on technology stocks, right? Yes, it's made its shareholders a lot of money with tech stocks, but occasionally you have to give some of that back. The fund's got a lot in FANGs. It's got a lot in NVIDIA. So uh, it's it's taken a, a rough uh, lot stretch the last three months. It's lost about 16%. Okay. You also pointed out some funds that have held up um, pretty well over this period. I was surprised to see Templeton Global Bond on that list because it's a volatile fund, sometimes does worse than other bond funds in periods of turbulence. What's going on there? Yeah, Templeton Global Bond is, uh, as you say, much higher risk than most bond funds because they've got a lot of emerging markets uh, and currency risk involved. Uh, but in this case, where they've been very cautious is on duration. The fund actually has a negative duration, meaning it actually benefits from rising rates. So that's helped a lot. It's got a lot of emerging markets exposure as well. And that's been kind of a mixed bag, but better than a lot of other areas. So, so it's actually been a, a nice performer. Okay. And on the equity side, quality has held up well. So I guess it's not surprising that you'd see a fund like Yakman do relatively well during this time frame. That's right. Yakman has, has an emphasis on, on quality companies like Procter & Gamble, and those names have really held up well. It also has a big cash stake. And of course, cash does well in a bear market. So 
uh, it's nice to see Ackman uh, having a, a rebound. It's another of those funds that's had a rough go of it for a while. But right. again, we understand the reasons, and this is sort of a proof of concept to see it looking good in a down market. Okay. Any other funds that kind of stand out to you in terms of having delivered strong performance during this rough stretch? Well, uh, Merger Fund is, is a fund that's up about 2.5% over the three months. Uh, it's one you kind of expect because it's doing merger arbitrage. It's a strategy that is kind of designed to not move with the markets because they're essentially uh, long one stock and, and they're long the acquisition target and short the acquirer. So uh, it, it's really what you'd expect. Uh, but it's nice to see it delivering uh, these kind of uh, market neutral type funds have not had much of a chance to deliver in this very strong bull market. So it's nice to see Merger Fund have its uh, day in the sunshine. Okay, useful recap, Russ. Thank you so much for being here to share your insights. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar.com. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening.